I am the energy editor of The Economist, but I've spent most of my life dealing with different aspects of European security. I was the Moscow bureau chief. I ran a newspaper in the Baltic States. I studied Poland, Polish in Poland during the Cold War, and I lived behind the Iron Curtain as a, as, as a journalist. And so I'm going to talk today mainly about the energy aspects of um, European security, or perhaps the um, security aspects of European energy. And I'm going to focus particularly on gas. Electricity is a really interesting subject, and we were just discussing over lunch the enormous importance of building um, electricity into connectors across the North Sea, connecting Ireland, and Britain, and, and other countries, and that's a whole big subject on its own. I'm very happy to get into that in the Q&A if anyone wants to talk about that particularly. And I will touch on a bit later maybe the effect of the fall in the oil price, which is also an absolutely enormous um, subject, which uh, has uh, both some implications that I think people haven't spotted and some implications that I think have been rather overstated. But I want to focus for, for this, this talk really on the question of Europe's gas supplies and Russia's role in them, because I think we've seen a historic change over the last nine years, and one that hasn't been fully appreciated, certainly not in Britain, where people see everything that happens through in Europe through the um, goggles, the distorting goggles of um, British exceptionalism. I speak as a former vice president of the Young European Federalists about 30 years ago, so I'm one of the few paid-up British Europhiles, and I hope uh, you won't beat me up for the sins of UKIP or anything like that, because I really don't, I don't like them. Um, but if you cast your mind back to 2006, uh, we were in a completely different situation with regard to Europe. We had many European countries that were 100% um, dependent on Russian gas supplies. We had other countries that weren't 100% dependent, but were very dependent. Um, I remember going to the um, German energy ministry in, um, I think, 2004, and asking them whether they were worried about the, uh, the German dependence, this is when Nord Stream was first being talked about, where they were worried about the dependence on Russian gas. And they said, well, we don't really have any alternative. They've got the gas, we need it, uh, we can afford to pay for it, they want to sell it, so that's just the way things are. And I don't think you'd find anybody, not even in the Bulgarian energy ministry, would you find someone saying that now. They've got it, we need it, so let's just go ahead. There's been a fundamental change in our... Um, what in military terms would be called situational awareness. People see energy in quite a different way, partly because of the political and diplomatic developments in Russia, partly also because of the vulnerabilities we've experienced in um, Russian gas transit, chiefly across Ukraine. We've had several um, instances, the first in 2006, but also in subsequent years, where arguments between Russia and Ukraine, and I wouldn't say at this stage um, where I'd say the blame should lie, mainly, but led to factories shuttering, people being cold, um, real energy emergencies in countries in, in, in Eastern Europe. And this map, which I think is from a couple of years ago, shows the way we used to be thinking about it. Um, I don't know whether this has got a laser pointer. Let's see. Is it, um, which, I don't want to blow the place up. Which one do I... <laughs> Here we are, okay. So we were thinking about Nord Stream, that was, um, and that was seen at the time as a big danger. This was going to allow Russia to bypass these main transit pi pipelines um, and supply gas to, to Germany. And the Polish foreign minister, my friend Radek Sikorsky, notoriously said this was the energy equivalent of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Now, thinking, now, I th uh, now thinking on, on, on Nord Stream has, has changed a bit since then, as I'll say. And then we had all these, these um, planned projects plus... Um, the, to try and get gas from here, where there's a huge amount, in Turkmenistan, also in Azerbaijan, and to get that um, to, across southeastern Europe and up into um, central Europe. And we had all these different plans. The main one was Nabucco, and this was the one that was strongly backed by the EU and by the United States, and that was going to get gas from Iraq, and we thought Iraq was going to be a success story from um, the, well, at least from the, the, Kur the Kurdish part of Iraq. Um, from, we would get gas from here, from Azerbaijan, and then we were going to build a, a Caspian interconnector and get gas from Turkmenistan. And the Russians had their own project of South Stream that was going to be straight across the Black Sea and then go on a slightly different route, bypassing Romania, going through Bulgaria um, and, um, and, and giving, giving them a slice of transit revenues and then up through um, in, into Austria. And then we also had these two pipelines here, which were much less talked about, were going to be built um, taking gas to, gas, gas to Italy. And the situation's really changed a lot since then. I hope I can now go to a 
um, slide. This is a rather complicated slide, but it shows what we are in, um, what we're in now. So Nord Stream has been built, and thank goodness for that. It's a really big shift now. The same Central Europeans, um, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, um, Hungarians, who were worried about Nord Stream being built ten years ago, now see it as a really important um, factor in their security. Because what it means is that so long as the gas is flowing from Russia to Germany, we can then send gas by re reverse flow um, into countries like Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and so on. And this is happening. We are beginning to, we, we are, we, we are beginning to get a sort of north-south gas grid. And I said to the um, Czech energy um, representative, a great um, um, friend of mine who's been doing this for years, aren't you worried that the Russians in a crisis will cut the gas off to Germany as well. And he said, if the Russians cut the gas off to Germany, we're going to be in uniform anyway, and we'll have other things to worry about apart from gas. <laughs> and I think, that, I think that explains it very well. That you, it's, it's very hard to imagine a situation in which Russia is going to cut off its main, its main customer and the only country in Europe where the leader still really takes, which matters, where the leader still um, takes Putin's phone calls. And that then allows us to supply... Um, makes us a lot less dependent on these transit pipelines. And we've actually seen a, a, a remarkable development, which I don't think anyone would have anticipated 10 years ago, that we are now supplying quite significant amounts of gas to Ukraine. We've got gas coming to Ukraine from Poland across an interconnector. We've got gas coming from Slovakia. And there's potential that isn't actually happening at the moment. It did happen a, few, a couple of years ago to send gas from Hungary. So the idea that gas simply flows from, um, from east to west, and um, there's one supplier and one customer, and there's not very much um, you can do about it, has, 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 has changed very substantially. We've also got um, LNG. Now, this map is um, slightly out of date. This one here on the Lithuanian coast has been built. This is the um, LNG terminal. Um, it's a floating LNG terminal, which is very interesting. The cost of LNG terminals has gone down hugely. It's still very expensive to make LNG, but it's got a lot cheaper um, to have a terminal to receive LNG. You can have this floating terminal. And um, this is at Klaipeda in Lithuania. And no sooner had it arrived than the Lithuanian energy minister was able to ne negotiate a very substantial discount on Lithuania's gas supply from Russia. It was a very, very clear illustration that even if not a molecule of gas actually flows from that terminal, even if you never need it, the fact you've got it puts you in a strong bargaining position. And more terminals are being built. The Poles are building one here at Finuszczy on the northern Polish coast. And there are others... Um, which I might get onto a little bit a, a little bit later, but that's one that that's one huge change. We are now able to see the, the, the beginning of the north south gas grid and the west east gas grid has put us in a different position. But there are other things that have happened as well. We are compared to two thousand six. We have an incomparably better um, awareness of data. We, the EU in two thousand six, when the first emergency happened, had basically no idea what was in gas storage, how much gas storage there was, what the capability was to ship gas around. That is now a very sophisticated um, operation. We collect um, we collect the data from all over Europe. Um, if there is an interruption, it's much easier to work out what to do. We've also built many more interconnectors. Some of them are on this map. So we've got the Polish Czech interconnector, the Polish Slovak interconnector. There is a Slovak Hungarian interconnector. I think is working a Hungarian Romanian one. Um, and we don't yet have, I think this is a bit optimistic, I don't think we yet have a Romanian-Bulgarian um, one, and we certainly don't have a Bulgarian-Greek one or Bulgarian-Serbian one, for the interesting reason that the permissions to build those are held by com companies um, closely connected with um, a certain foreign power, who I might mention in the off-the-record off session later. Um, so it's, not, it's, it's far from complete, this, but we have, um, and this is very largely thanks to the European Union. The European Union identified the, the, the structure of the gas grid as a major, major weakness. It identified the lack of data as a major weakness. Um, it also an, an identified the lack of storage as a major, major weakness. And it's put serious money and serious political effort into making that happen. I do apologise to the people at the back who probably, unless you have fantastically good eyesight, you probably can't see, um, see any of this. But if you, if you Google it... Sorry? We've got another screen. Oh, you've got another screen. Oh, right. Okay, I, I, no, I no longer feel sorry for you. We've got our own data. So, that, so that, that's been a very important thing. We've, we've also had the third energy package, which is one of those immense, what we call it, the economist, boring but important stuff that, if you know about the subject, really matters, but is very hard to get people excited about if they, if they don't know about it. But this has basically broken the Gazprom business model in Europe. It's made it impossible to own the pipeline and the gas 
that flows through it. And this was why South Stream, which I'm going to just highlight here, the, um, the, the, the great Russian um, prestige project, which made no real economic sense, but was a wonderful way of exporting corruption into the countries um, through which it was going to, going to pass. A great victory for the EU, almost totally unremarked in the British press, was that in the end, these countries, these transit countries, did not want to sign up for a pipeline which the European Commission had said was going to be illegal. The European Commission said very clearly, you cannot build a pipeline and um, own it and operate it. And the Russians said, um, yeah, that's very interesting, thank you, don't lose your enthusiasm, but we have an excellent deal with our friends in the Bulgarian and other governments and we're going to go right ahead. And it was a real battle of wills. It was sort of alien v. Terminator um, in, terms of, in terms of energy policy. And the Russians really believed that they were going to be able to face down the Commission. They thought the Commission would not be able to stand up, not just to having these rinky-tink little East European countries, but what the Russians call real countries, i.e. the Austrians and the Italians, who were going to benefit from South Stream. They said the Commission simply won't be able to withstand this sort of political pressure. And we will get an exemption, we will be allowed to build and operate South Stream the way we want it, and we will be able to export gas, influence the energy markets, and pump stuff into the political systems and public life as well. And it didn't happen. Very humiliatingly, Vladimir Putin had to say at the end of last year, we're not building South Street. There were financial pressures as well, Gazprom short of money. But that was a really important victory for the European Union. What comes next? Um, I'm aware I've been rabbiting on and we want to get onto the, onto the Q&A. Um, there's a lot more still to do. I talked to Minister Shevchevich, uh, the sort of vice, vice president of the Commission, Shevchevich, who's the um, head of the, who, who runs the overall energy portfolio, um, a couple of weeks ago, and wrote about that in the Economist. And his task is to make the energy union happen. And so his big priority, which he's going to be presenting in Riga on the fifth of um, February, is interconnectors. He's we've basically done what needs to be done um, in terms of the third energy package of dismantling. Um, this uh, market abusive model. Um, but we need to do a lot more on interconnectors, both on gas and on electricity. For example, we need to get this Lithuanian Polish one built. We need to get the, um, and particularly here, the Hungarian um, route to the coast. This is perhaps the single most important thing in, I think, in, in, in European energy policy, is to sort out the row between Hungary and Croatia, which is one of these sort of extremely boring commercial squabbles, build an LNG terminal here on Hungary's coast which, and do reverse flow on the pipeline back up to Hungary. And I think that would then lead to a radical change in Viktor Orban's um, energy policy. Viktor Orban, the Hungarian prime minister, has become a notable Putinista um, to the dismay of many of the other um, Central European countries. But one of the reasons is he doesn't really get on well with his neighbours. He he's very worried about being... Um, dependent on gas transit across Ukraine, and he saw South Stream as the best way of, of, of widening his options for getting substantial amounts of, of gas from an independent source. Um, if we can build that, I think that will have a big, a big breakthrough. Um, we need to go ahead with the other LNG terminals as well. But the final thing, which I think will be is absolutely crucial, and this is perhaps the thing to watch um, this year in terms of European energy security, is what the new competition commissioner, Margrethe Vestager, does on the complaint against Gazprom. This was one of the, a great epiphany for Vladimir Putin, Alexei Miller, and all the other people who run Russia, something they never thought would happen, I think it was uh, three, four years ago now, when commission officials, with search warrants and without using their prosecutorial powers, broke down the doors, um, metaphorically, I think they actually just rang, showed the warrants and were let in, in... 20 or 30 Gazprom offices and affiliates all over this region and went in and seized documents, confiscated computers and took them back to Brussels and analysed them in order to prove exactly how Gazprom had been abusing the rules of the single market, chiefly with its country-by-country -country pricing um, but also with other market-distorting behaviour. And that led to what in um, EU jargon is called a complaint. It's exactly the same process that was used against Microsoft. If you remember the row with Microsoft, perhaps more than 10 years ago now, about whether it was fair to bundle um, Internet Explorer with every version of Windows. And Microsoft, rather like Gazprom, didn't take the European Commission seriously. Big mistake. Talk to anyone from Microsoft, they would admit that was a very, very fundamental misapprehension. They did not see 
that the, Euro the European Union's Competition Commission was something to worry about. And the, the Competition Commission can impose fines, and it can impose more fines and more fines and more fines. It, can, it has the full force of law, and it can collect them. It also has the ability to in, it make legally mandated changes to business models. It can ban you from doing things. And it also um, has the ability, um, if, it has, if, a, if, a, if a complaint goes through, there's also scope for class action lawsuits by all the people who've been um, the victim of this market abusing practice. And so that's really important. I see it as a kind of giant torpedo aimed absolutely at the heart of Battleship Kremlin. Because if that complaint is launched, it's curtains for Gazprom, its current form in Eastern Europe. It'll do far more damage than, the, um, than even the third energy package did. It'll be humiliating, it'll be expensive, and it opens a whole can of worms in terms of all the, all the other things. Now, this complaint was, was, was already finalised, actually, this time last year. And it then sat on Commissioner Almunia's desk because, with everything that was going on in Ukraine, people felt this is not the time to pick another flight with Russia. Now, hawks such as me would have said this would be a great time to turn the pressure up on, on Putin. This is an absolutely perfect time to do it. And by not doing it, we signal weakness. And as with South Stream, the, the message the Kremlin got from the fact that we did not go ahead with that complaint um, was that um, the, they, they were able to face down the EU, that political pressure was getting in the way of what's essentially a judicial issue. The Commission here is not acting as a political body. It's acting as, as the competition authority. It shouldn't really be open to political influence. But, of course, these things do happen. And... So it was postponed. Almunia said he wanted it to be um, finished by the time he actually said, I believe, off the record, something on the lines of, I want Gazprom's scalp on my desk by the time I clear it. Um, I may be being slightly more colourful than, I, I, than, than he actually said it, but he certainly was, it was a, a very clear priority, but it was postponed and postponed and postponed, and in the end, Almunia left, and we got the new commission, and it's now on Verstager's desk. And that is the thing to watch for. I think if the Russians are able to face down um, the Commission on this, it will be a very major victory and it will allow them to continue to consolidate the position they've got in Central Europe. It will dismay people who are going for um, more energy independence and will be really quite a setback. On the other hand, if it goes ahead, I think it's curtains in Europe for a very important part of the Kremlin's business model. We'll be basically saying to them, if you want to play in our pitch, and we're playing, to take an Irish example, we're playing Gaelic football here, don't try playing rugby, it's completely different. Um, so on that note, I'm going to stop, and I, if you don't mind, turn the cameras off, and I shall be very happy to answer questions um, on background. Okay. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Alan.